I want to see that. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, solutions for your journey. And by Intrepid Control Systems, over the air engineering. Boost your game. Gary. John, how are you? We get to go do another show. We do. I, so so I, got, I, I got to ask you a question. It's, it's, it's topical, a little off subject, but topical. Okay. Okay. So you undoubtedly watched the Super Bowl on Sunday. I did. Okay. Were you at all surprised that there was no advertisement from one of the Detroit Three? Oh, I hadn't thought of that. There were car ads. There were car ads. But Audi, yeah, GM was not BMW. there. Ford was not there. Right. Stellantis had already yeah. announced they they were not. It didn't going. do one of its amazing ads that it had done over the years that became so famous, the M M&M and M ads and so on. But you know what that also tells me? They have nothing new to show. <laughs> Could be a fair point. I mean, that's why you spend millions on the the Super Bowl is you got some big product new you want to show everybody. So if you don't have anything new to show, you don't spend the money. But you know, General Motors had that Will Ferrell ad that. Um, they did two versions of, and they basically were talking about, you know, electric vehicles will be coming. It right. wasn't like to buy this one. So Right. Well, as you know, the whole narrative on electric cars has changed, changed somewhat. And we'll, we'll get into that. But, you know, we, we've got Larry Burns here, and you were the one who arranged to have him come on the show. So why don't you tell the audience what Larry's all about? All right. So, 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 so I can't even talk. Those of us here would just say, oh, you know, of course, Larry Burns. Everybody knows Larry Burns. But so for those of you in the audience who are not familiar with the man, and it is hard to imagine that you wouldn't be, um, perhaps most famously, Larry headed R&D at General Motors for a number of years. Um, and he was the corporate vice president of research and development and planning and strategic planning. And from 88 to 97, he had a number of other jobs at General Motors. Then he became perhaps even more famous <laughs> when he became a consultant to Google, aka Waymo, on the autonomous vehicle that they developed. And he's the author of a couple of books. He's consulting with a variety of companies in the automotive space, and he's just an all-around genius. So, Larry, welcome to the show. <laughs> and you, we should Jerry. mention Frank Frank yeah. Marcus, our friend from Motor Trend. Yes. Glad to be here. Yeah. And with Larry. And with Larry. That's right. Uh, Brilliance will rub off, I'm sure. <laughs> it's the aura. Glad, yeah. Glad to be with all three of you. So, Larry, yeah. you know, one thing that we've been promoting on uh, about you coming on the show is you're the guy who created the first EV skateboard. And I know you didn't do it alone. You had a great team behind you. Yeah. But just I, I'd love to know some of the background. How did these ideas come together? Mm -hmm. Because no one's copied exactly what you guys did, but they sure took that concept of a skateboard and have run with it. So how'd you guys come up with the idea of doing it in the yeah, first place? Yeah, yeah it's, it, it's a great story, John. Um, when I was named head of R&D, that was in the 1998 timeframe. Uh, Rick Wagner, who had been my boss for four or five years leading up to that, Rick and I sat down and just had a one-on-one -on -one lunch and we got talking and, and Rick said, you know, Larry, if we were gonna invent the automobile today, rather than 100 years ago, what do you think you would do different? And I said, geez, Rick, I would really try to do something about human driving and safety. I'd try to do something about propulsion and the side effects of the car. And um, he said, well, that's what I want you to think about. That I don't have anyone else on my team that's going to have the time to think about that. So Rick really gave me the freedom to really think about a totally different approach to the car design. Had you been thinking about that at all? Well, just no, on your I, own? you know, John, I'd been out of R&D for 10 years at that time. I, had, I left R&D in 1988 and went into the operating side of GM as a program manager and all of that other stuff, worked in the plants, which was a phenomenal experience. So I had really not been giving it a lot of thought. So one of the people who started reporting to me when I took on this new role was a guy named Byron McCormick. He led GM fuel cell activities at that time, but before he was very involved with uh, the initial Stabila track. Before that, he was involved with the EV1 and the batteries for EV1. Byron and I had this discussion and he said, Larry, this is all about that little patch where the tire touches the road. And anyone who can create the software that can get control over that on all four corners of the car is gonna be a winner. So we got kicking around with that. We also had brought Chris Brony Bird into the company, and um, he was really fixated on this interface between technology and design. He called that design and technology fusion. 
And we, we teamed up and, and uh, said, what would we do different? And we went to work on this. And um, we, we, we knew we wanted to make a visual statement with the designs. We had great teamwork with the design studio. They were instrumental in what we did. And it just started to come about. But it was this corner module, really, that captivated us more than anything else. What do you mean, corner module? Well, really, it's, it's this notion of some people call that a wheel motor. I call it a corner module because I like to integrate the steering, the braking, the suspension, and the torque management all up integrated into one package. And if you get that right, you make four three or four per vehicle, maybe two, three or four per vehicle, but the scale of production is phenomenal. And you also have the tire and wheel, obviously. And and it was just the ability to package the car differently if you can manage what's going on at the four corners with the software, do the differentiation through the software and dock a different body on top of that skateboard. So you're going to get huge scale economies. And then because um, it was an electrically driven vehicle. You could lengthen it and make it wider without tearing up your entire production system. And um, it just sort of took on a life. So we, we did that. And, and it was funny because we came back after we showed it at the, uh, I think it was the 2002 North American Auto Show. You know, Rick said that was really a lot of fun. And it was getting a lot of good press. He said, what's next? And I said, this is a strategy board meeting. I said, cars that don't crash. And our chief counsel said, Larry, never utter that publicly because you're going to spend the rest of your career testifying because you believe cars don't, shouldn't have to crash. Well, from my perspective, I always was fascinated by the subway system in Tokyo. And when all these trains would come in, and you'd see people swarming in all different directions. They weren't running into each other. So I'm saying, why do we have to take it for granted that cars should run into each other? And that then kicked off this passion of leveraging OnStar and trying to uh, get down a path of eliminating the crash. And that ultimately mor morphed into the autonomous driving and the DARPA Urban Challenge. Mm -hmm. But that, that's a lot of what was going on back then. So, so Larry, you, you slipped by. You, you mentioned fuel cell. Now, as I recall, the skateboard mm -hmm. was a fuel cell, mm -hmm. which, of course, no one has certainly duplicated. I mean, the, there are skateboards related to EVs. And this was, was very early on and even thinking in terms of fuel cells. Talk about that aspect yeah, of yeah. it. It is interesting, Gary. I think if I could have a do-over, I probably would never have uttered the word fuel cell. I would have called it a hydrogen battery because so many people jumped on the fuel cell electric vehicle and the battery electric vehicle as being these radically different things. And in fact, it's really just how you store the energy on board. You still have electric motors, you have power electronics, and you can architect the car very similarly because you could store the hydrogen in that skateboard platform or you could put the batteries in the skateboard. So somehow the world saw these as two very different things, A or B, batteries or fuel cells. And I've spent a long time talking about what I call the power of and. I think it's both of them. So we, we needed to make the vision of autonomy real. So we did two other concepts, one called high wire and one called sequel. Sequel actually had a battery because we had learned by then that the real extreme transient requirements of the fuel cell for everyday driving, those real extreme things were compromising durability. So if we had a little bit of stored electricity and we can merge that with these real peak requirements of, of, of the demand on the fuel cell, we were going to get a much longer life on the fuel cell. So yet again, it was hydrogen fuel cells with some energy storage, which you could pick up from the regenerative braking and things. So SQL was really the embodiment of what I call the new DNA of the automobile. Didn't quite have the autonomous yet. But that got me thinking about, um, no kidding, if we were going to do it all over, starting with a clean sheet today, I felt it was going to be an, a, a DNA based on autonomous driving and electric drive and uh, connected vehicles versus the human-driven combustion-based uh, 100-year-old um, industry. Are you at all disappointed that that was like 2002 and in 2024, there isn't a skateboard with those individual corners? We, we see Continental, I think Schaeffler and some other people have have talked about having, you know, corner modules. And I think Re-Automotive has a skateboard that they're coming with soon, but it's mostly for you know, delivery vehicles and so forth. 
And why do you suppose that hasn't really taken up? And we almost saw it also in the Lordstown oh, yeah. thing. Oh, yeah, the... yeah. I mean, people do talk about Unsprung Mass. They, they talk about um, those characteristics of the design and engineering. I just feel frank with these kinds of ideas. We just need to, we need to be patient. I think the architectural benefits of going to the wheel motor will be huge. But quite honestly, I'm not disappointed with what you get in an electric vehicle when you when you just drive t two motors off the same or two wheels off the same motor too. That's that's not a disappointing experience. But I just feel the future of the industry is all about design innovation, and the technology continues to advance, and we've got a world's worth of very, very capable designers from all kinds of countries. And I think people will want to make a fashion statement. I, I still feel we're going to get back to the fashion roots of the industry. I think we've had this run-up of the cost of the vehicle that uh, has gotten out of control. It's just stunning to me. I used to do my stump speech a few years ago, and I said the median price of a vehicle was $35,000. Now it's approaching $50,000. And Clayton Christensen, who is a great business uh, writer, had this book, Innovator's Dilemma. And you can just see what's going on with, with the vehicles are getting way over-designed and way over-specified. And something's going to come in underneath that. And I think that's where the wheel motors are going to play out. And we're going to get back to maybe cars that last a year or two. And, and we get back to this being a fashion-based industry. And I think the wheel motor is going to be an amazing enabler of design. Because you can just drop different top hats on for this, different top uh, hats. the latest fashion. Yeah. You can have two wheel motors, you can have four, you can have three, and you're not having to create an all-new supply base or an all-new platform or architecture and do all the uh, recertification of all of that. Kia kind of played with that at CES with the modular uh, things that would drop onto their, yeah. I don't know if that was a skateboard per se, it might have been a, a cab and a module back, but. But I, I want to hear more of your ideas on taking cost out because I've just finished writing a, an op-ed piece that hasn't been published yet that I'm saying we're at peak auto right now. Car sales in North America, Western Europe, Japan are less than they were a decade ago. Now, COVID had a big you know, impact on the drop in sales, but the downward trend was already there before COVID Absolutely. hit. Absolutely. And we have priced, the auto industry has priced millions of households out of the new car market. Yeah. And so if you look at the percentage of Americans who are buying a new car, it's at its lowest point in the last 70 years. Yeah. Lowest yeah. point. The yeah. peak was in 1978, by the way. Yeah. And if the same percentage of Americans bought a new car last year as they did in 1978, uh, the sales would have been 23 million. Wow. 23 million. That's fascinating. So that just shows you yeah. how much, the only thing that saved the industry in the U.S. is population growth. So I think there's only two things that can change this peak auto premise that I'm positing. Uh, either household incomes have got to shoot up way above where they are right now so people can afford what's out there, or the industry's got to take out costs. So what would you do to take out costs? Well, yeah, yeah. Let me put just a little bit of preamble on this because I think it's an extremely important subject, John. If EPA has a trends report that they put out every year, if you haven't looked at it, I find it fascinating. And they look at, like, for example, in 1982, all of the cars that were built and sold in the U.S., and they'll give you information on how much did they weigh and how much horsepower did they have and what was their zero to 60 acceleration. And if you compare 1982 to 2022, a 40-year journey, our vehicles are 40% heavier. Okay, so that mass means cost, John. It's 40% more material. The horsepower, 175% higher. And you zero, know what? I, I'm kind of in favor of that. I get you. <laughs> it was kind of a bleak time. And, and John, the zero to 60s are 55% higher. So what's happened is all of this technology that in the early 80s was aimed at trying to get off of oil or reduce our dependence on oil as a nation and make our cars cleaner and safer, it's been translated into mass and power but, and speed. But let me challenge and you. And cost, and cost. And cost, but I'll challenge you because we've seen an enormous shift to trucks and SUVs. Absolutely. So I think if you looked at a sedan from 1982 oh, to a yeah. sedan of 2022, yeah. 
I, I don't That's think there's, because no, there's EPA no is question about that. But, out. Well, John, but yeah, the reality is we have people doing driving in their everyday life, jumping in the car, running in the cor- to the corner store, and four and five thousand pound machines, and these are one hundred and fifty pound, two hundred pound people, and that mass combined with velocity is kinetic energy. One half mass times velocity squared is kinetic energy, and so. All of that extra speed that I talked about and extra mass has made the entire roadway system much less safe because of the kinetic energy that we have in it. And your point about peak auto, if you really look at how people are living their daily lives, there has been something much more important than increasing speed. It's what information and communication technology has enabled relative to accessing things, things like remote work, e-commerce, online health, online learning, social interactions where you don't have to travel. So you've got this enormous run up in price, and you're right, either incomes go up or costs go down, but my premise is we're going to see a significant drop off in the need to get in a car and go somewhere to live our daily lives. One quick example. My daughter is a chef and she has an online food planning business. And so we cook her recipes regularly. And one of her recipes that I was going to make the next day called for a spice called tandoori seasoning. We didn't have it. So I said, I'm going to jump in the car and drive three miles to Johnny Pomodoro, the nearby market, and get the tandoori seasoning, hoping they had it. Well, I decided instead to look on Amazon Prime. And I was able to get my tandoori seasoning within 16 hours on Amazon Prime on my porch for a price less than Johnny's, and I didn't have to drive to Johnny's, park my car, walk in, walk around the store, pay for it, and come home. There's no amount of increase in speed in my car that can save me the amount of time I save by not making that trip. So, John, people aren't going to be making the kinds of trips we made in the past on top of this run-up. So Clayton Christensen, the Innovator's Dilemma guy, will say, something's going to come in underneath that. Very simple. My first car was a 1969 Volkswagen Beetle, brand new, $1,500. My mom and dad gave me as a gift the down payment. I had to make the monthly payments. That year was peak Beetle. Over 300,000 were sold. One out of every 20 cars sold in the United States was a Beetle that year, John. And the mass, I don't know, maybe it was 2,000 pounds. Certainly, it wouldn't be safe by today's standards, but it worked just great for my accessibility. I think the biggest threat to the auto industry, an auto company, is not another auto company. I think it's this pivot to how people live their lives differently and the role that these machines play in their lives is going to change much more than even electric connected and autonomous is going to change. But Larry, you did a study, I think, for Columbia University a few years mm-hmm. ago, looking at the number of vehicles that a municipality would need yeah. and found far less. Could you just talk to us about that a little that bit? Was, it was stunning. Um, I, I had left GM and um, Columbia recruited me in to lead their program on sustainable mobility. So I had a 25% appointment at Columbia and a 25 sir. And um, I had a great colleague, a guy named Bill Jordan. He was a marvelous math modeler, one of my best friends. We do things together a lot today, even today. And we got interested, we, you know, because Uber was just coming on the scene and, and Autonomous had some interest in it. So this was in the 2011 time frame. So we asked ourselves, what if you could take all of the cars in Ann Arbor that sort of are in Ann Arbor for the daily, everyday activities and replicate what those cars are doing with a two-person electric autonomous pod that's shared. How many would you need in order to have very fast response when someone requested a trip and meet all of those travel demands? So in 2009, the government had done a household travel survey, so we had really good data on Ann Arbor travel patterns. So we simulated it. And 120,000 cars in Ann Arbor, which were being used for these daily trips, we could do it with 18,000 shared pods, 15%. I said, how, how could that be? It turns out even during rush hour, the maximum percent of cars in Ann Arbor that were on the road in rush hour was 
you guys, people leave their cars parked 90 to 95% of the time. So rush hour feels like rush hour because in that case, 15% of them are on the road. And we replicated this from Ann Arbor to Rochester, New York, to Salt Lake City, to Palm Beach County, to Manhattan, and over and over and over again, we got this result. And it convinced us that we could take the out-of-pocket cost per mile, which AAA gives us every year, from something on the order of 70 to 80 cents down to something on the order of about 20 cents. And plus your time value, because these were autonomous vehicles. And you scale that, and that was a disruption, Gary, of $4 trillion of the U.S. economy when it was scaled. So that was the Columbia result, and that was the basis of this book I did called Autonomy, because it was such a profound and exciting potential. Now, everybody thought I was advocating a future that everyone would use robo-taxis. No, that was just an example of what could be possible. The real prize here is autonomous personal cars. Over 90% of us own a personal car. And the real, real big prize, I think, for autonomous vehicles is, is the personal car. And I think the pathway there is, is ADAS, just getting better and better. And just today, General Motors announced it's doubled the road network that Super Cruise can handle. So Mary talks about the percent of situations Super Cruise can handle. And, and she just increased the percent of situations radically by adding all those roads in. It's one more step toward that. And I think that's, yes, I think I'm proud of what Waymo's doing. Absolutely applaud them for the progress they've made on Robotax. That's an important segment for a lot of people. But there's a, I haven't given up one bit on fully autonomous the, personal The cars. first frontier is the second car. Like, a Absolutely lot of people, uh, EVs are fine for a second car. Maybe autonomous is fine for the secondary. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's how you have to look at it in terms of the consumption unit, which is the household. And quite honestly, the definition of a household could get expanded because sharing becomes so much easier because we're all connected. So my two-car household or three-car household might be and I'm making this up because my kids don't live locally, but if my daughters lived locally, it might be my two daughters in their homes and my wife and I all sharing a fleet of three cars. And if you could reposition one of those cars autonomously, it's, it's, it's really as convenient as having it in your garage. So that's where this gets exciting to me. I, I just feel like, well, the industry's worked hard to pivot from combustion, human-driven, um, oil energized vehicles. And that's a big, big, big change. And I don't want to underplay that at all. This is at all. It's a hugely complex industry to pull that transition off. Again, I think there's something bigger behind it. What do you think about the bridge technology of the re remotely piloted car? So you've got a car, uh, you know, a Mary Barra, maybe next step one with, you know, a million miles of roads that it can do level three plus, And then to get from your house to your daughter's house, maybe someone in a remote place using all the sensors or whatever drives the car over there. We've already got that going yeah, yeah, on some yeah, rental car companies yeah, now. Yeah. I'll put one, one refinement on that, Frank. I, I think it's absolutely part of the solution, but I think we can use real-time and historic um, telematics data to know with certainty if I wanted to reposition that car with no one in it, which stretch of that trip I don't, I know I don't need any help. Yeah. And then maybe there's a really tough left turn coming up. History tells me that, and I'm not 100% confident I can handle that with my autonomous driver. Then maybe I have someone looking at it through a camera at that, confirming to the autonomous driving system that it's okay to make the left. So I, I, again, it's this power of and, it's combining all these different enablers to, to get you to a system. And I don't think level five is the goal. I don't think we'll ever get to level five. Just like airlines don't fly on really bad weather days. If you're driving on Loveland Pass in Colorado at midnight in a snowstorm, you probably don't belong there. So to dismiss autonomous cars if it can't handle that situation, I think is a little bit short-sighted. So I think it's just going to be this step-by-step. -step. You know, what engineers do for a living, we make what's possible real. And we do that through learning cycles. And that's what Wayne has been doing. Is it, has it been taking longer to get the degree than everyone thought when they kicked it off? Yeah. But you know what? They're still in the game. 
Larry, I want to go back to, to John's point about peak car and costs and what you seem to be describing. So the, the, the three households having three cars rather than the six, six cars, right? <laughs> so, so basically what you're doing is you're, you're, you're taking vehicles out of production, right? There'll be fewer vehicles, but arguably those vehicles will be more expensive because of the technology. So on the one hand, you have the OEMs faced with reduced production. On the other hand, you have the consumer faced with oh, an yeah. even yeah. more expensive vehicle. Yeah. Well, first of all, we've got to shift completely away from price at the dealer's lot and focus in on cost per mile. And I think that was maybe one of the more important contributions in that Columbia paper and to some extent in the book. When you start thinking about it as cost per mile, it's energy cost, it's maintenance cost, it's insurance cost, it's parking cost, depreciation, obviously, and finance cost, plus your time cost. And as I said earlier, the biggest time savings are the trips I don't have to make. And then if I do make a trip in a vehicle and I can use all of my time and how I want to, don't have to drive at all, that would be great. But what if I could have 90% of my time because 10% of my attention is required to handle that tough left turn up the road. So I think a lot of companies in this space are missing this integration of real-time telematics with the capability of the autonomous driving system. And um, then changing the situation awareness challenge from getting my attention in milliseconds or seconds to getting my attention a couple minutes in advance when I need to be prepared. Like a na navigation system will tell me, Larry, half mile up the road, you're gonna have to turn right. And then I'll say, thousand feet up the road, you're gonna have to turn right. Well, what it might be saying is, Larry, thousand feet up the road, you need to be in the seat looking right and left to help me. Or there's a hill coming up with a blind curve. I need you paying attention then. But 90% of the time, I can zone out. Think about the recreation vehicle industry as an example. What if you could get an RV and you could go from Detroit to Denver on the interstate with some version of Super Cruise and 95% of that with confidence, everybody can be asleep? No, right? we're not going to be asleep. We're going to be partying. <laughs> <laughs> partying. 5% of the time, maybe someone needs to be paying attention on the interstate. Then you get to, to, Colorado, to Denver and you jump in the driving seat because going up into the mountains needs more human assist. Then you arrive at your campsite, and it happened to be a fuel cell vehicle, and your water supply was created from the emissions of your car while you were driving from Detroit to Chicago. And the sensors you had for your ADAS system now become security sensors to sense a grizzly bear coming into your camp. <laughs> and you go on and on and you start to connect these dots on what kind of experience can you now do in, in the boondocks. And I just think the sky's the limit. And I think it's exciting for experienced designers to think through where these different industries can head. I'll take it to one more step. Why does our house have to be fixed to the ground? Why can't we just simply have our homes truly someday be more advanced mobile homes and, and not have to have all this fixed utility-based infrastructure? Why can't that be part of the future? Um, I, I, I'm not being facetious here. I mean, it, it's absolutely possible with what's going on in the home building industry, affordable housing, and I begin to think through this dramatic change in how people might be living in the future. That's what the auto industry needs to get to prepare for. And what I'm talking about is not 2050. The enablers already exist for what we're talking about. So Larry, it enhances the, the shrinking car market and shrinking cars yeah. and houses. Okay, look, this is a perfect segue to take a quick commercial break right now. Give a shout out to our sponsors and we'll pick it up right after that. How do Bridgestone tires stop shorter on wet roads? It's their hydro track technology but you don't have to know how the science works, just where the brain is. What really matters is their Bridgestone. We want to know what drives your testing, OTA, connected car, diagnostics, remote testing. Intrepid Control Systems is here to help you work from anywhere. Intrepid Control Systems, driven by your data. 
All right, we're back. We're talking with Larry Burns, and he is taking us into the future. <laughs> All right, so, so Larry, so while your book Autonomy, which came out in 2018, is certainly famous, my favorite book that you worked on was out in 2010, which was called Reinventing the Automobile, Personal Urban Mobility for the 21st Century, which you wrote with the aforementioned Chris Baroni Bird and uh, the late William Mitchell. Now, in that, you talk about vehicles, but you also talk about the urban environment. And you know, you just mentioned the possibility of having uh, mobile houses. Um, but in, in, in that book, you, you talk about how urban planners need to be involved in the transportation business. Yeah. Talk to us about that. Yeah. Well, first, I'm really glad, glad you brought that up because uh, Bill Mitchell was a, just a phenomenal MIT professor, a, a great visionary, and as, as has Chris Bromley Bird, been a great collaborator. So I'm, I'm so glad you, glad you this Bill that. Mitchell is not the famous GM designer. Bill no, Mitchell. No, no, no. Bill Mitchell is a famous architect, urban planner at MIT, who just everyone admired, and he, he unfortunately passed away just after the book was was published, but he was a great, great colleague to, to deal with. But in, in this, I think it's real important, especially for Americans to, to, to understand what I'm gonna say next. Maybe I'll give you guys a quiz. What percent of Americans, when they get asked where they live, say they live in an urban area? Time oh, okay, Let, time up. I, I'll say 40%. Okay, well, the facts are, 25% of Americans say they live in an urban area, 53% say they live in the suburbs, and then uh, the rest, 20-some percent, say they live in rural areas. So, Gary, I think the transportation business has been overly preoccupied with urban transportation. Not that it's not important, but not everybody wants to live in a city with the population densities like you see in Manhattan. A lot of urban planners think the single most important variable for sustainability is population density. I happen to love where I live in Franklin, Michigan, in, in the suburbs. And I think 53% of Americans are voting the same way. Uh, so I really, really think personal transportation and goods transportation has to be looked through the lens of rural and suburban every bit as importantly as urban. And I do think some of the people in rural areas feel disenfranchised because the so-called elitists are writing about things that they just can't see fitting into their life when they're out in these less uh, population, uh, less dense popula populated areas. So with that said, um, the, you didn't mention another book that I did, which may be the most interesting one, and it was my dissertation, and I published it in 1979 as a book. And it was called The Transportation, Temporal, and Spatial Components of Accessibility. That's a mouthful. But the important message there is when you look at how we live our lives, the activities that we participate in, yes, there's a transportation piece. I have to move from A to B to do something. There's also a geographical piece. What's at B? And then there's a scheduling piece. When I get it, B, is it available? So let me give you a quick example. When I started at General Motors as a co-op student in 1969, I worked at GM R&D, and um, my boss would come every Friday and physically give me a check. I would get in my car at lunchtime and go cash my check because I needed money to function and put the rest in my savings account. I get there and there's a big line because everybody else went to the bank on Friday at noon to cash their check. I had a car, there were plenty of banks. The problem was the scheduling of the bank versus my work schedule. Then along comes the ATM, the automated teller machine. Suddenly I could get cash 24 seven at a whole bunch more locations and I didn't have to make that noon trip to cash my check. I could handle that in a much different way. I don't go to the bank anymore, Gary. My kids, I don't even think, know what a bank is. <laughs> and that's what I'm talking about in terms of activity patterns. And so urban planning, or I would call it community planning more generically, is an extremely important piece of this. But the real dimension that's changed considerably is the time dimension. When you look at the internet, there are certain things you can engage in that are scheduled on the internet. 
if I take an online course and that's being taught from two to three, I have to, I can do it at home or I can do it somewhere else, but two to three I'm scheduled. There's a lot of things I can do, including shopping 24 seven, totally freed up of any time-based constraints on my life. And that's where all of this innovation has come from since the early, since, since the digital age, which you sort of date the digital age of 1980 roughly. And that time going forward, you know, the internet, the iPhone, and now we're getting into the AI and all of that stuff. And that's what I think we need to understand about the future and the role of automobiles, public transportation, flying cars, all of that stuff, um, recreation vehicles, has to be understood in terms of how our time-based and geography-based constraints are changing. That's enabled by all of this digital technology. Larry, one of the things that people worry about is all this e-commerce. There's so many vans on the road all the time, and there's a worry about, isn't this increasing congestion and pollution? But you got a fairly simple explanation that I'd love to hear on that. And in fact, I think it even uh, resounds around that uh, tandoori spices that you were trying to buy. Yeah. So you asked the question, was I responsible deciding to buy my tandoori seasoning on the internet and asking Amazon Prime to drop it on my porch. This thing couldn't have weighed more than four ounces. And I'm asking a maybe a 6,500-pound van and a 150, 200-pound person to come and drop this four ounces on my porch. Is that the right energy and environmental decision? It certainly is if that same person stopped at my neighbor's house and their neighbor's house because the marginal cost of just stopping off at my house if he's en route to my neighbor's house from an energy standpoint is virtually zero, John. And these delivery people take a minute and a half to three minutes. I've studied this to death, actually, because I have, I have a contract with a new town that's being built and we're puzzling over how do we get packages to, to our residents and that last mile solution. So they're spending a minute and a half to three minutes to get it on my porch, plus, obviously the transportation piece. I I wish I've had the time to model this, but I think as a function of population density, there's going to be a critical density above which it's more environmentally responsible to have the delivery van bring it to me than to have me go to the store. And certainly if I go to the store just once a week and gather up everything I need and I could get all of that stuff from one place, that might be a different answer. And, um, but I had an experience um, just recently. I, in our kitchen, we've got this drawer that pulls out that has the garbage can in it. And our house is going on 30 years old. And the track for that garbage can failed. So I look at Home Depot and I look at Lowe's on the internet. And neither one of them have what I consider to be a very common hardware part in inventory. Their response was, we can have it brought to our our store, and you can come to the store, and it'll be here in three hours, or you can pay $15 and have it delivered to your house. Amazon Prime, again, got it to me within about six hours for less price than either Lowe's or Home Depot. This e-commerce, John, is so disruptive, and Amazon has changed the game on all of the fundamental players, the Targets, the Walmarts, UPS, FedEx have all had to respond to Amazon. And we know what happened to Kmart when Kmart had to respond to Walmart. Kmart's problem was their systems just could not compete with the systems Walmart had in in logistics and supply chains. And we're seeing that whole thing play over again with Amazon. So to understand the future of the automobile, I believe you need to understand the future of consumption. And consumption is what we do when we live our daily lives. That's not just buying things, it's consuming experiences. And when I grew up, a lot of the experiences I had required me to travel. So if I wanted to engage with a girlfriend, I would get in my car and go over to her house and we would go somewhere. Today, a lot of that's being done just by engaging without travel. And I don't know exactly where this is going to go. The girlfriend I don't know the thing exact is not, time. It's not so good with the girlfriend thing. If you're just doing it on the screen. Just, just <laughs> yeah. to point that out. Fair enough. Fair enough. I don't know the exact timetable, but my gut tells me it is going to reduce vehicle miles traveled per year. 
not a tiny bit, but a meaningful bit amount. And what does that mean for the car industry? And this is right on top of your peak auto. Right at the moment where the cars seem to be reaching a peak price, there's going to be this other transformation that begins to question totally the role of these machines. Now, what kind of machine might be nice for me to have? A personal valet. Something I can dispatch to go do something for me. And I think personal is what it's all about. Think about it. If 90% of Americans opt to own their own car, households have a car at 80 cents a mile, and you can drop the cost of owning a personal machine to 20 cents a mile, which direction do you think ownership's going to go? That's economics 101. It's going to go up, not down. So people are going to want to have their own machines. It's a real question of how they fit them into their lives and, and use them as a, as a valet of some type, as a personal assistant. Um, one last story on this, and I, I'll embarrass myself on this one. I, I do most of my daily travel in a Chevy Traverse, um, approaching probably over 4,000 pounds. My wife does hers in an Audi TT. Um, she does about 5,000 miles a year. She, she's a hairstylist. And hardly ever goes on the freeway. We use my vehicle to get to our cottage. That's why it's an SUV. I also use that to drive to the country club. From my home to Bloomfield Hills Country Club, it's a 15-minute drive. Um, max speed limit, 40 miles an hour. I don't need 4,000 pounds, 80 miles an hour to make that trip. I would love to make that trip in a personalized autonomous pod. And I'd be very happy if that was at 35 miles an hour. Didn't stop at light because we've got a control system that lets me weave through traffic. But what's the impediment here? It's all of the really big vehicles on the road. And that's an externality. That's making me exposed to risk because other people want to have a really big car. It sounds like secondhand smoke. It sounds like a world where people used to smoke and take for granted that I had to accept the fact that they smoked. And you know what? We've moved past that as a society. Maybe we can get our arms around this mass issue and this speed issue in some way that collectively as a society, we can see a future where we're all moving around as we need to or want to in our daily lives and machines that have radically less mass, radically less material, and are, are radically safer for collisions between each other as well as interactions with can other Can we really lawyers. honestly hope for any kind of government help with something like that when the government is really how we got to these giant vehicles by saying your car, yeah. you know, cars have to be you know, get this gas mileage. And so if you want to tow something is, well, trucks can be big. So suddenly, yeah, surprise, everyone has a truck because yeah. they still wanted that yeah. capability. I mean, that was the, the reason we got where we are. How do we get out of that yeah. with the system great, we have? Great question, Frank. And I've, I've, I've thought this through specifically, and I've retraced the history of the industry and how we arrived at this point. So a really, really pivotal moment is when they decided to regulate trucks different than cars. And that was an amazing moment. And that allowed the pickup trucks to remain body on frame. And then we could drive the initial SUVs off of that body on frame. But keep in mind, we were making huge scale volume underneath those pickup trucks. That's why you can make so much money off of them. They were skateboards in essence. And, and I think we've got to get off this notion of cafe and fuel economy regulations. And we've got to for lack of a better word, no one will like this. We've got to tax mass and we've got to tax top speed. And I'm not saying you can't have a big vehicle. And I'm not saying you can't have a vehicle with more power and the ability to tow and to go fast. I am saying you need to be responsible for the externality of your kinetic energy, mass times velocity squared, one half mass times velocity squared, and be held accountable for that to motivate people to not make every trip in such a big, fast machine when they can make it in a smaller machine. I'm hoping that could kick off a cycle of less mass in the vehicle mix gets less mass. I'm hoping that as autonomous technology and ADAS technology gets better, the probability of a crash, even with bigger and faster vehicles, goes down. 
Um, I'm on the I'm an executive advisor to a company called Neural Propulsion Systems, and um, they've developed radar technology. I know you're familiar with that, but we think we can see three to ten times farther. Explain that a little bit, Larry, because I, will, I know I, about it, but I'm I not will, sure that I, anybody I in the audience. Yeah. This is a a software defined the software radar. Software defined, yeah. So you take the existing hardware and radar, so it could be TI's radar hardware. And it it sends out signals and brings back data. So you take that same data coming back, and we run it at NPS. We run it through a mathematical algorithm that has its roots in uh, MRIs. And people didn't like to be in the MRI tunnel very long, so people were anxious to find a way to process the data faster so they could get a person out quicker. And this breakthrough occurred at Caltech and MIT, I think, in around 2012 or something. And uh, the, the founders of N- NPS thought they could apply that to um, autonomous driving. So they went to work on it, and they've made great progress. And with just new software using existing hardware, um, we've been able to prove, I, I think definitively, that we can see farther, clearer, and faster with better resolution significantly so. Now you take and you apply that to a future world where automatic braking is regulated and pedestrian automatic braking is regulated and all car companies have to meet that and they're faced with, do I slam on the brakes or not? And that decision has to be a function of, are the tires worn? Is the pressure right in the tires? How big is my load? because all that stuff contributes, how wet is the road? And certainly if you could see twice as far up the road and differentiate what you're seeing better, the chances of you slamming on the brakes when you didn't have to go down considerably. So we think this is a big deal, John. Does that kill LIDAR? Well, we believe um, we have a chance of having LIDAR-like performance with radar with this. I don't wanna ever rule out a technology because I believe in and not or, and I think LIDAR will find its its role. There'll, there'll be some physics type situations. Take, for example, Aurora. Um, I had a, the privilege, Chris Ermson invited me out to ride in his truck about a month ago. I went to Houston. We rode from Houston to Palmer. Unbelievable experience. This is a beautiful Peterbilt Class 8 truck. He's got these really cool t- trucking terminals to begin and an end. The truck had to maneuver on surface streets to get on the freeway. But Chris is showing increased confidence for Aurora to go commercial in partnership with Continental, in part because of what they've done with LIDAR. 80,000 pounds at 70 miles an hour is a different set of physics than light-duty vehicles. So he may need LIDAR. I, I don't know that for a fact, John, but he may need LIDAR down the road, given what he has to take account of in stopping those kinds of vehicles. So I don't want to rule out LIDAR, but and, certainly... And even LIDAR could have, could benefit from the same digital glasses oh, that you're putting on the Absolutely, Frank, yeah. The, the like, we, we think the software has relevance for that. So, it's, yeah, I'm an optimistic technologist in terms of life experience. You guys know I lost my hearing in the early 90s. I lived a year deaf. I hear today with cochlear implants. And the journey from the uh, 1993 when I got my first implant to today has been one of learning by this technology, better batteries, better speech recognition software, better electrodes. And the company I get mine from is called Cochlear Corporation. They've hung with every customer and they let me get these upgrades. And I went from not hearing music to one day hearing the Beverly Hillbillies theme song that my kids were playing (laughs) to now appreciating ZZ Top and the Doors and the Stones. Any music I grew up with, I can enjoy because of engineers who are making what's possible real. Tell us a little bit about that story. I mean, you just went deaf like that, I right? Like that. I had lost my hearing in one ear when I was 20, and then when I was in my early 40s, I, I lost Was this a disease? Is it genetic? What, what? They don't know. They, they rule out all the scary stuff and they just said it happened. The hair cells in my inner ears just went limp and stopped functioning. I went to bed, I knew it was a Thursday night because we'd watched Seinfeld. For some reason that sticks in my mind. And I woke up in the middle of the night, nauseous, I couldn't hear. We went to University of Michigan Hospital. And again, they 
they have their usual suspects and they rule those out through testing. They tried to bring my hearing back with high doses of steroids, IV steroids. I was in the hospital for that. And one day I was laying in the hospital bed and I look out this window and I see this massive dragonfly. And it was the emergency helicopter landing on the roof and I was hallucinating on this stuff that it couldn't bring my hearing back. And so I, I lived a year and General Motors was remarkable. I had a boss named Don Hackworth who just took me under his wing and he said, we're gonna let you do your job fully. They got me a stenographer that traveled with me and would transcribe what's going on. My administrative assistant would transcribe my voicemails. I was back in the voicemail days and I muddled through it and then I got my implant. I had to prove I was really deaf before they would let me have an implant. So they needed a year of that proof. I got my implant and they said, you know, just hang with it. Everything was noise, John. And just listen to the AM radio. So I'm listening to you every day. But I'm not making any sense out of this. And one day, about a month after I got in it, I, I hear this white Bronco and OJ. <laughs> I go, what's going on here? OJ, white Bronco. Couldn't figure it out. I got home and turned on the TV, and that was when he was driving in the Bronco. And I go, oh my God. That was the first time I connected AM radio voice and something that was really happening. I knew it was going to work. I knew it was going to work. And it was just learning curve from there on. So what, do they beam an over-the-air update? Or how, how do you, how does this cochlear implant improve over time? It is a software. Um, right now, I go to University of Michigan um, Hospital. They have a clinic that's remote from the big hospital. And they'll do a uh, upgrade, a reprogramming of it. And then periodically, I'll just... Um, Medicare is pretty good about letting me get new upgrades for the hardware. Never the wire. The wires are the same wires. So imagine this. The wire in this year goes back to 1993. 22 electrodes firing in some organized way with every sound. Think of the engineering that went into those materials to allow that to still be firing away. It's just remarkable. So you can't help but be an optimistic technologist. I know sometimes people see me as a dreamer or they say I'm hyping something. I get that. But you've got to put the storytelling with the world of the possible to give people hope, to get them excited, and furthermore, to give pushback on the people with the vested interest in the old way because they are very, very good at pushing back and making people believe that this stuff isn't going to happen. And so it's just the politics of it. You, you learn over the years that all these dis different voices are in play. You guys play an extremely important role, especially the three of you, because of your interest in technology and your commitment to fact-checking and trying to really understand and tell the story in, in a way that everyday people can understand. You see, this will only happen if we have collective will. So back to getting smaller vehicles and managing the safety. Collective will is only going to happen through common understanding. And common understanding is only going to happen through your profession. And, and we need to, we really need to hold on to that. Mm -hmm. so, so, so Larry, let me ask you about your, your optimism in, in light of what we're seeing in the industry right now. Mm -hmm. Now, over the past few months, it seems as though the vehicle manufacturers, at least those in North America, are beginning to be a little less bullish about electric vehicles. They seem to be pulling back. Now, do you see this as they're becoming technological pessimists, or are they seeing this as the market regular people are not ready for this technology? I mean, I mean, how do how do you see this? I think it's the latter. You know, again, the, the, it's exciting to tell stories about autonomous cars and electric vehicles. And so it's natural that the media will pick up on these stories and tell these stories. The auto industry is extremely complicated. You're talking about vehicles with tens of thousands of parts sourced from around the world, safety critical products, and a market that is highly differentiated with people having a wide range of different needs in, in their vehicles. And somehow it tends to get oversimplified. Let's not forget the fastest growing segment in the U.S. has been electric vehicles. 
But on my stump speeches, I think I've been pretty consistent on it. No one should be betting the farm. I, I really believe plug-in hybrids, and GM did pioneer that with the Volt, and I was still at GM when that project bubbled up and was a strong proponent of that because in our daily travel, most of the time we don't go more than 40 miles. And so if you can plug in and get your 40 miles off of the grid each day, you're not buying gas very often, but you got the peace of mind of not running out of electricity. That makes all kinds of sense for transition purposes. But some of the regulators wouldn't give companies credit for that. They wanted ZEV. Zero. The answer is zero. So no matter how good this plug-in hybrid could be and how good of a fit it is, they believe it keeps fossil fuels in play. The reality is the amount of fossil fuel used in the world is so enormous that we're not going to get off of it in one step. We've got to have an intelligent way to manage a transition. So I, I just really think, Gary, we've got to get a lot more people grounded in reality. The technology is there. The infrastructure isn't quite there. I certainly haven't given up on hydrogen and fuel cells. I believe there's going to be a day where I get my hydrogen and a cartridge delivered by Amazon through e-commerce. Wait a minute. Wait, go into more detail. Let, let's hear this. I'll go back. Let me finish this point. So I, I, have not, I have not lost my optimism on this, but we've got to be realistic. We can't say shut down oil and shut down natural gas because I put $7,500 on a nose and an EV and go, it's done. We need oil. You look at the number, what, 250 million vehicles in the United States need gasoline, and we're still dependent on it. We've got to find a way to manage the transition. And yes, it's a heated debate. How much time do we have before the planet passes a critical tipping point? How urgent is all of this? But transportation is not the only sector that's con contributing to climate change. I think we're contributing 15%. There's a lot of other people who have to step up to this as well. So, Gary, I, I believe Einstein is right. The best design is the simplest one that works. My passion for electric vehicles, be it battery or fuel cell, is grounded in that principle. These vehicles will have half as many parts in them as combustion-based human-driven vehicles. And that's less engineering, fewer design interfaces between those parts, better quality lower cost and less labor and the tension behind the UAW strikes were absolutely grounded in that we've got to manage the transition and, and um, as soon as our politicians and others wake up to that and bring some sanity back into it and get into a longer term transition plan I think I think we'll be in good shape now let's go back to hydrogen yeah yeah, yeah. let's go back to hydrogen when, when I was still at GM and the fuel cell program reported through me and Byron McCormick was leading it, the industry sorted down to 700 bar, that's 10,000 PSI, compressed hydrogen is what we would store in the vehicle. And that would give us sufficient range to have cars do what gasoline cars do today. Everybody's happy with that. Toyota's done a marvelous job perfecting their compressed hydrogen tanks. And they're so good at that kind of stuff. And we knew that would be safe and we knew it would work. Meanwhile, and at the time since I left GM, scientists have been working on new classes of material. One class of material is called graphene, which is a very thin material with, with a huge surface area. And they're creating ways to put hydrogen into matrices of these materials. And the hydrogen doesn't chemically bond to the surface. It's held in place by these forces of how atoms interact with each other. They're called van der Waal forces. And it looks like we can get the same amount of hydrogen at 50 bar as we have at 700 bar. So that means a cartridge, like the cartridge I have under my sink to filter my water, becomes a viable way to give me hydrogen. Now imagine if my car sitting in my driveway and through my connectivity, Amazon knows four of my eight cartridges are empty and they're bringing me this part for my kitchen drawer. They throw four cartridges of hydrogen in. The marginal cost of getting me my hydrogen is zero because they're coming anyhow. They swap out my empties, put in my fulls, and I'm not worrying about this one bit. And Amazon's producing the hydrogen at their fulfillment center using scaled electrolyzers and renewable energy. 
Do you think Amazon would like to sell energy? Yes. Do you think it's a breakthrough to not have fixed infrastructure at corner gas stations or at recharging and parking structures? It's a breakthrough, John. So you've got to look at this stuff with a longer term lens. And people will rule out hydrogen and fuel cells. They'll say it's not as efficient as solar directly into your car battery. This isn't an efficiency debate. It's a capital utilization debate. And they're not factoring in something else that's very important. How much capital is going to be required of the electric grid improvement once we get past about a 20% market share of electric vehicles in the, in the national fleet? Massive amounts of capital are going to be needed because when you two go home living on the same street, hypothetically, and you want to do a rapid recharge at the same time, your substation may not be able to handle it. So we it's all the power of and. I'm totally in favor of batteries and electric vehicles. I'm totally in favor of hydrogen and fuel cell electrics, which are really hydrogen batteries. We are not solving the sustainability problem, putting 2,000 pounds of battery in a pickup truck to make it an EV. 8,000 pound pickup trucks just because they're electric, that remain parked 90 to 95% of the time. All you've done is taken the lithium out of the ground and put it in a parking lot. That is not solving climate change. And I think there's a lot of merit to what Toyota is telling us. I can take that same amount of battery and maybe do 20 or 30 plug-in hybrids and move the needle on carbon dioxide in the atmosphere a lot faster. The regulators have got to embrace and celebrate that, not say that's not a ZEV, therefore we're not going to give you a credit. So, so how long does the transition take? Gary, I learned years ago to not put timetables on things. As soon as I put a date on it and that date passes and it hasn't happened, they're going to say I was hyping it. So I focus on something different. I focus on tipping points. So the real question is when are we at a point where the value exceeds the price, so people want it. So the value of a connected electric autonomous vehicle exceeds its price and people want it. And the price exceeds its cost, so companies want to make it. So at that point, the market will naturally scale that. And that will require a lot of capital and a lot of time to get rid of the old fleet and put in a new fleet. I think those tipping points in all three of those runs, I think we've passed the tipping point on connected vehicles. And I think we're at the tipping point on electric vehicles. And I think autonomous vehicles could be in a five-year window following this ADAS path forward, plus the great progress Aurora and Waymore are making. But I can't predict that for sure. But I, th I think from a tipping point standpoint where Everybody looks at that and says, yeah, we can do a transportation system, an accessibility system, mobility system based on connector electric autonomous that people are really going to want. They're going to pay the price that lets me get a return. I think we can have those proof, proof points, certainly within five years. We should be able to. And, you know, I think with that tipping point, that's probably the perfect way to end this show. <laughs> Larry Burns, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been a fascinating hour. Good. Fascinating hour. I enjoyed we're, it. And we're going to let you go away for a while, but we're going to have you come back and we're going to empty more of that <laughs> knowledge out of your brain. Yeah, five years and see if I've been right. <laughs> but really no, good. I mean, it's, it's really, really hard to predict the timing because of the learning. This, the people call, sometimes they call these technologies frontier technologies, and they just don't have the same investment aspects to them in terms of their uncertainty and what needs to be learned and how you find that value sweet spot. I always remind myself, anti-lock brakes, it was into our sixth generation version of anti-lock brakes in GM where we put it standard on all Chevrolets. So we had to go from a one model of a Cadillac as an option all the way through to every Chevrolet. What happened during that journey? Each generation had lower cost, better performance, higher volume, and convinced the developers that it was worth going to the next generation. That's how engineers make what's possible real. 
And a lot of people aren't patient for that learning. And a lot of companies don't have deep enough pockets to go on that journey. But that's what has to happen here. Yeah. <laughs> well, again, thanks so much, Frank. Great Thank having you. you on the show as always. And Pleasure. Larry, we'll just keep our <laughs> Larry, I called you Larry. <laughs> Gary, we'll keep on doing this. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, solutions for your journey. And by Intrepid Control Systems, over the air engineering, boost your game.